Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dennis there used to be my MBA intern last summer. Uh, so for people who want to intern in the Philippines, uh, do let me know after my, my talk, right? And I think Dennis can talk about that from a first-hand experience of how is it to intern in an emerging market. Uh, just a show of hands, who here has been to the Philippines or Southeast Asia, right? So a couple of you, right? So that's actually good. Um, what I want to talk to you about is really the intersection of you know, my experience here, for example, in Silicon Valley, and then what the experience that I saw when I moved back to the Philippines about two, two and a half years ago, right? And this is what Idea Space is. Um, I know you had a, a speaker from, uh, I think, is it Japan? And, uh, then, and uh, then China. And then China. And in the Philippines, it's gonna be a very different type of innovation. Uh, innovation that's focused on emerging market needs. And I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. So. You know, um, please let me know if you have any questions at any time in the 45 minutes to an hour. I want to make this an interactive discussion, and hopefully these stories will inspire you to really help out the people in emerging markets. Right, so for people who don't know anything about the Philippines, um, we're actually a island nation, right? Um, well, a, a, a nation with a, a 7,107 islands, uh, just below Hong Kong. Uh, a laser, okay. Uh, I haven't done a laser in a long time, but uh, cool, right? Uh, right, so this is where it is. This is where uh, Indonesia is. This is Brunei. So we are at the east side of Southeast Asia, but very also close to Taiwan, Hong Kong, etc. But what's unique about the Philippines is not necessarily just our geography, but also our cultural heritage, right? So we were a Spanish colony, uh, the main Spanish colony in Asia for 300 plus years. And we're also an American colony for around 50 years. Right, just think about it, right? European, American, in Asia. That's the Philippines. So for example, my name is Earl, right? That's a Western name. My last name is Valencia, which is a Hispanic name, Latin name. But then I'm from Asia. Right, and that's what the Philippines is. That's why I think it's a very interesting platform for people to pilot products or to have products to pilot in the Philippines and then expand to other countries. In fact, a lot of the startups and also some of the large companies use the Philippines as a test market. I know when I was here in the GSB, Taco Bell did their, their uh, pilot in Southeast Asia in the Philippines because American affiliation. Right? So I moved back to Asia uh, after about 12 years uh, being in the US. Right, and Richard talked about kind of my experiences. And I'll tell you about the main surprises that I've seen uh, when I went back to the Philippines. And uh, you guys will also be surprised because we have this concept of what innovation is in Silicon Valley, right? I was in you know, the headquarters of Cisco looking at like how to create the next billion dollar business in networking. And what's our mantra? In a world of unlimited bandwidth, guess what? Most of the world don't have unlimited bandwidth. In fact, most of the world don't even have the internet. How do you work in a world that the internet is sparse and the internet is not ubiquitous, right? And what are the problems faced with the millions of people in these types of situations, right? So um, the Philippines, again, is quite interesting because we're the second largest uh, country by population in Southeast Asia, about 100 million people. Uh, 12 largest in the world. Interesting fact is that 10% of our population lives outside the Philippines, around 10 million people, right? Um, we're one of the youngest countries. People, 50% are under 23. So that's quite also intriguing. So we don't have the baby boomer problems uh, like in uh, the West. And then our main common language is actually English, right? So people talk in Filipino, but then most people will understand English. And that's why um, the big growth area also in the Philippines is the outsourcing market, right? So we're the fastest, second fastest growing nation in Asia after China, around 7% growth, right? Um, you know, but one thing that we don't have yet is that our GDP per capita is still around the 3,000, maybe now $3,500 range, right? So just imagine, if you're an investor, right, and you give somebody $10,000, $15,000, that's already five times, right, the average per capita of the country, 
So the, the beauty about that is that you can do a lot. You can make products with very little capital. Right? And that's the opportunity for some of you guys who might want to invest in emerging markets to create product there and perhaps think about how to globalize uh, from that situation. Right? And then you can see here that there's really this hockey stick that's happening only the past five to seven years. Right? Happening in our country. So that's, that's really the, the, the interesting part of actually a lot of the emerging markets in Asia, maybe in Africa, is that you have this hockey stick literally only in the past five plus years. So what does that mean? There is both hunger and there is optimism. Right? There is optimism as to what's going to happen in the country and where can their lives be, especially if you have a lot of young people right, in the next couple of years. Um, I'll actually shift now to a video so you can think about what are the different problems and then what are the different solutions that's happening now in the Philippines. So this was, I'm not going to take credit for the video, it's uh, from uh, the DevEx. It's like a LinkedIn for the you know, international development community. Uh, and then I got this thing called the 40 under 40. So it's a good overview on the Philippines and the opportunities in the Philippines. I realized that uh, education is such a huge problem in this country. There's so much hunger in the Philippines. The biggest roadblock really is the fast-growing population of our country. We are uh, a country in transition, and as we transition, there are actually a lot of problems that need, need to be solved. I think all businesses and all development work comes first from finding a problem. And most importantly, a problem that you have the skills to address. We see uh, big organizations working on big issues, but we also see a lot of everyday heroes, they say, making a difference in the communities where they work. The Philippines has always been this potential that has not seen its potential. At a certain point, I realized that I wanted to do something with more social impact. What drives me is being able to provide opportunities to every Filipino. I want to improve healthcare in this country. I want to improve the lives of people. Harness our natural resources and to change the world one company at a time. Using my talents to really lift up our country through what I know best. Economic and personal empowerment is something very powerful. For me, that kind of transformation is also what drives me. If there's anything that's gonna come out, especially in development in the Philippines, I think a key thing is governance, good governance. All along, I've had this interest and passion for applying private sector discipline to development and to do something that has social impact. My passion is really to, to see meaning in what I do and to see actual impact in the lives of the people that we really want to help. Definitely headed in, in the right direction. That's um, very loud and clear. I believe that the Filipino is one of the greatest minds in the whole world. But people just have to know that we exist. Nonprofit sector here in the country, civil society is very strong. Primarily because it's natural for Filipinos to help each other. I'm most motivated when I see for myself how our programs have actually helped uplift the quality of life of the people. And that drives me every day when I get up and realize that what we're doing is benefiting the lives of millions of Filipinos. Knowing that at least they're making some small difference. Passion won't always carry you through, but if you send your heart forward, 
the rest of you will follow. In order for us to compete, uh, we figure that we have to strengthen our education program. To make the Philippines a destination for business and technology. To be able to see that in my lifetime, our country has become uh, one of the leading countries, not only in Asia, but in the world. Good. So, uh, that actually gives you a, an interesting overview of what is entrepreneurship in a place like the Philippines, right? There are social problems that need to be addressed. Healthcare, education, inefficiency, right? I'll tell you more about that. Uh, in the coming presentation. But then what is also common with the video, and these are all the top social entrepreneurs in the Philippines, is that people are excited of the future. Right? Where are we going to be headed? And I think we're headed in the right direction. Right? What does it mean? Um, at least for people in the finance world, um, we've grown at least since 2011 around 50 plus percent in the stock market. Right? Um, so there is opportunity. And I think we're heading up in the right direction. And it's because we got also uh, the investment grade uh, first time since 2003. Right? So in 11 years, we're never you know, seen from the financial markets as somewhere we should, you should place your money. It's only in the past year that we got actually in record pace right, all credit ratings to make us investment grade. Right? So it means that the big mutual funds, financial institutions can now put money into the Philippines. Right. Um, and then some other structural questions is, what do we make? What do we make in the Philippines? So this is from uh, the Harvard Center for National Development. And what surprised me is that we make also a lot of technology-oriented ones, but then it's low level. How do we make sure that we actually grow to export things that are a little bit on the value? Right? Instead of just manufacturing, how do we build something from scratch? But another phenomenon that's happening in the Philippines is the growth of inter-Asia trade, right? So before, it was always the US. That's our biggest trading partner. Right now, China, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, major trading partners. But then also you can see that the trajectory of the exports, the Philippines are also growing higher. OK? But is this picture real? Right? You can see from the video. Is this growth really trickling down? And that's the question that our entrepreneurs always look for. Right? Is this real? How can we solve this? Real picture. Right? You have the skyline of Metro Manila, but then literally kilometers apart are these slums. Right? So there's literally multi-million dollar condos, but people live kilometers apart in these types of shanties. Does the growth trickle down? Right? This is transport. Right? Every time there's Holy Week, things get crazy. Right? People move to their provinces. There's like a million or two million people who take the bus each month. Right? Because people can't afford to fly. So how do you fix this problem? This is a real picture. It's chaos. Right? Chaos. And actually, most of emerging markets, this is the situation. Right? Disaster, you guys know about Haiyan, right? How do we actually prevent more disasters from happening in the country? Right? Because hundreds of thousands of lives are lost each year. And things never change. We get around 25 typhoons each year, right? And maybe five of them are as strong as Katrina. Every year, right? Plus earthquakes, plus volcanoes. How do we make sure we respond? How do we make sure people have health care at the edge? Right? Because people can't afford to spend five hours, right, literally on commuting to go to a tier tier one hospital. They just can't have access to it. And then this is really what Idea Space was founded, right? So interesting enough is that we're a nonprofit incubator fund. So we run everything like a venture fund, but then we don't give back money to our LPs. Right, so interesting. But this is where we created. How do we fuel that hunger for the future of the youth? Right, and I'll tell you about the interesting story of Chino. He's one of the entrepreneurs that we mentored in the past year, and this is the Philippine Stock Exchange. Right, this is where he's from. 
an island, literally you'd have to take 24 hours by a boat, pump boat, to get to where his island is, right? He even told me an interesting story. You know, it's 24 hours, so obviously there's nighttime, pitch black. And he said, I hope when I wake up, I'm closer to the island, right? Or else you'll be somewhere in the middle of nowhere, right? So how do we uncover these entrepreneurs, right? And guess what? This guy in 12 months is making revenue $150,000 already. If I did not try to look for someone like Chino, what will be his story, right? Another interesting story is a guy named Gian. We found him, he was 18, 19 years old, right? One thing he told me, my dream, what's my dream? I wanted to go to a school called De La Salle. De La Salle is basically the top private school in the Philippines. But give, to give you perspective, right, per year, the tuition fee of De La Salle is 5,000 US dollars, right? But guess what? His family could not afford 5,000 US dollars to send his kid to college. So he went to a school called the Polytechnic University of the Philippines where the tuition fee is $100 per semester. But guess what? This is the scenario. 40,000 kids crammed up, right? But all they want is opportunity, right? We're lucky, honestly. I went to Stanford like you guys. When I went to the Philippines, I realized how lucky we are to get these opportunities like this, right? I was even in a GSB a while ago and one of our professors is like Eric Schmidt. Right, the CEO, chairman, I guess now, Google. I took it for granted. Right? I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to see Eric Schmidt anyway. We went to the Philippines and these guys, I wish they had that opportunity too, but they don't. Right? Everyone has, is hungry for opportunities, but never have access to. Right? But guess what? These entrepreneurs are trying to solve their own problems. Inefficiency, bus transportation, right? education. Those are the types of companies that are being created in places like the Philippines, Indonesia, India, right? So how do we actually support them? So we launched Idea Space in March 2012, right? We thought about it, and I actually pitched the idea to uh, my chairman of trustees. His name is Manuel Pangilinan. He's the uh, chairman of the largest telecom operator in the Philippines. And he said, we have to do it for the country. Why? Because we're in major infrastructure projects. And then we cannot sustain our growth if the growth doesn't trickle down to the entrepreneurs. Right? And why is it so important? Again, another interesting perspective slide. We talk about these companies, Apple, HP, Cisco, Google, Oracle. Guess what? If we stack up all the six, its revenue is bigger than the GDP of the Philippines, right? But what's the reverse? What is my goal? To find that one that would maybe be that next type of Oracle or Google because it could create 20% or 30% GDP growth just by one company. Imagine if I find two. How many millions of people's lives will be impacted if I find one or two companies created in the Philippines or maybe in Jakarta to help their economies grow, right? So in the number of two years, we're big on advocacy, right? So we've already talked around 150,000 students, young professionals, right? To make them dream. We started literally from ground zero. When you talk to somebody and say, would you want to work for this cool hot startup? Or do you want to work for the big telecom firm or Procter & Gamble? Guess what? 100% will say, I want to work for Procter & Gamble. Very different, right? So this whole session is talk about the differences. So hopefully make you realize that in the emerging markets, we have to help make them realize what are the opportunities? What are different options for them? We made 18 investments. You know, people always say, don't go to emerging markets because people will copy your idea. We want to change that perception. Let's create global patents a patent library from the Philippines. And to give you some interesting perspective, uh, from Philippine inventors last year, 
um, there was around 35 invention patents filed. Right? There's hundreds filed patents from Microsoft, Google protecting their IP. But from Philippine inventors, 35. And we filed five out of the 35. That's 20% of the entire patent, invention patent filing last year came from Ideaspace. Right? And then some of them are already making revenue, some of them have launched. Right? So we try to inspire, we try to incubate, and we try to connect them. Honestly, right, these entrepreneurs need access. Access to knowledge, access to capital, right? Access to knowledge, reading TechCrunch, it's not enough, right? Who here reads TechCrunch, right? I read TechCrunch, but that's their concept, right? That's their concept of what entrepreneurship is. That's where they get their advice. Just imagine if all of you in this room go to places like Myanmar, Jakarta, right, Philippines, and give your knowledge to them. Just imagine, those few minutes you've spent with these entrepreneurs could change their lives. And we're backed up, and I'm lucky that I found some benefactor to say, I believe in your vision. Right? We're backed up by, it's called the First Pacific Group. Right? So we're the largest uh, telecom operator, 70% of the market, 70 million people, 50% um, of all toll roads. Um, we probably have the largest electric uh, utility and energy utility water utility, and Indonesia, the largest food and agriculture company. And all of them committed to fund idea space for the next five years, right? Around 10, half a billion Philippine pesos, so it's around 10 to 12 million, depends on exchange rate, right? Um, but then people always ask, why do you always mention this slide, right? Because honestly, in Silicon Valley, sometimes you think that large corporations are not that sexy, right? But in emerging markets, just imagine, these entrepreneurs, that I mentioned a while ago, they say, I am backed by the largest business group in the Philippines. Can you get five minutes of your time? Someone will answer the phone call, right? Versus, I'm random startup, right? From the public school. Can you give me five minutes of your time? Right, and the difference, in Asia, there's a big power index difference, right? The people who have power feel they have more power and the people who have less power feel they have less power. How do we make sure we shorten this power distance index? Right? And by doing that is by affiliation. And some of the best minds in the country are in large corporations. So they get the mentors also from them. Right? So just some perspective. The revenue of our group is around 5% of the GDP of the Philippines. Right? And then we have good supporters from the Amazons of the world. The intellectual Property Office. I know I, I told Professor Dasher in Stanford Business School, et cetera. So you also go all around the country to what they call a smoke them out, right? How do we find those interesting entrepreneurs in different islands? So what do you have to go on the ground, right? I tried to do some Facebook, social media, YouTube campaigns. Then I realized only 30% of the people have access to the internet. So I ignored 70% of the people in my first year. So what did I do? Right? This is the advice of my board. You have to do a physical roadshow. Right? So for the past year, every other week, right, I'm probably in a plane to go to a different island, different place, to try to find one right? in a room like this. I hope they inspire one, two, three, four, five people to at least take a chance to become entrepreneurs. Right? Um, because in Silicon Valley, Entrepreneurs are sexy. In places in emerging markets, it's not as sexy, right? And interesting enough, some of the professors even prevent their students from thinking about the technology idea. And why? Because they don't understand how to grade it, right? So what did they say? Why don't you create a food stand? Because I know I can judge how many sales of fish balls, right, you can sell versus how many users you're getting. I know how to grade that. That is the reality of the situation. So we have to go there. We have to spend our time. So we go all around the country, et cetera, right? And then we have to bring people to the Philippines, attract them. So I'm sponsoring the 500 startups, Geeks in the Plain, to go to Manila. We have an event called Geeks in the Beach, which you can come, right? It's simply a tech, like a TechCrunch disrupt in the beach. 
when we bring people like the city of Amazons in the Philippines right now, we do startup weekends, etc. Right? And then incubation is probably what you're also interested in. Right? So each year we run a national competition. Right? Something like Y Combinator, something like 500 startups. You know, but what's the difference? We have to make sure we have equal opportunity for anybody. So we take out names. We take out affiliations. Right? So I know in Silicon Valley, like, what's the difference? My name is XYZ, the other one is ZYX. Doesn't matter. But it does. Right? Just imagine if your last name is the same as the last name of the president of the Philippines. Right? Someone, even, even if you don't think you're biased, you will think in your mind, hey, is this a cousin? Right? Is this a relative? So our first thing is we take out affiliations, right? So that anybody has equal opportunity based on their idea, right? So that's actually quite common sense, but revolutionary in our market, right? Because we're a very relational market, right? So what do we give them, right? So we give them some capital, right? We give them potential additional investment. Legal support, financial mentoring, we give them office space, we give them housing. So when I talk to my colleagues in Singapore, they're like, why are you giving housing? And I know here it was Y Combinator backed. Some guys from the Philippines, they spent all their money from Y Combinator to find a housing in Palo Alto. Right? Because it's so expensive. So just imagine that guy from the island, he cannot afford to live in Manila. So I have to make sure that the friction is gone. Develop what? Product, get customers, right? So make sure they focus on that. And then they give them around half a million, which is around ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000. And people say, that's so small, right? But guess what? That's three times GDP per capita, right? An average engineer salary. I hired the number one engineering graduate in the Philippines. Some of you guys know this story because I was shocked myself. Number one in the board exam, right? Guess how much HR gave him salary? $500 a month. So for people who are taking engineering and getting good offers after you graduate, just imagine that. Right? Someone from Manila, someone from these emerging markets, graduate number one in the entire country, $500 a month starting salary. Right? And then we get around 600 plus applicants per year around 1.7% acceptance rate. Um, so tech starts around 1%, 500, maybe it's now less than two. Y Combinator, maybe two, 3%, right? And then I know Stanford's the most selective undergrad now, it's around 5%, right? So we, you know, we really try to find them and then really create who are the best ones so we can back. But then what the most interesting chart? Again, I'm a Cisco guy, I'm a Silicon Valley, I'm an engineer. I thought I'll get mobile, cloud, you know, software as a service, right? Everybody knows these trends. And then this is what I got. And sorry, I, I couldn't scale. I tried to do this last night when I arrived, but I had a hard time. Half of them are what we expected, right? Telecom, mobile, digital media. But then half of them addressed markets which I was totally surprised. Transpo, healthcare, agri, energy, water, even mining based ideas. Unbelievable, right? But this reflects the population. This reflects the needs of the market. So I got shocked, I got surprised, but then I realized this is where we should focus. Right, so we have a six week kind of incubation because our, our market is so immature, a number of our startups in our first batch blew up. Not because they just didn't get customers. Actually, in fact, all of them probably got customers. They couldn't decide how much shares they would split the company. They couldn't decide. So they're in fighting, crying, all these things happening. Right? Splitting up the shares among the founders? Among the founders. Okay. Among the founders. They couldn't decide, why is one 20%, 21%, I'm 19%, you know? Zero revenue, right? So 
Uh, but that's, that's the, you know, but it's, it's important, I guess, for these guys. But they don't take these conversations seriously, right? And they don't make these types of commitments. They just split up the company four ways, five ways, right? And then, uh, so what we try to do now is to make these tough conversations early before we invest larger amounts in them. Makes sense, right? But I didn't think about that the first go around. Um, we got the geographic distribution. Again, this is like Luzon, right? The major island where Manila is. Metro Manila, here's Mindanao. Right, this is the Visayas. This is where Haiyan hit around there, right? So Visayas only got around seven percent of applicants. But the interesting part for the second batch is that we got other countries to apply from Indonesia, Singapore, Chile, and Pakistan, right? So hopefully we grow our international base in the future. So this is what people always wait for. Who did I invest in? And um, our first batch is very platform centric, right? Internet. So portfolio MNL is a kind of a Behance for Southeast Asia. Uh, Pinoy Travel is uh, like Expedia for buses, right? Bus reservation system. Right? Again, I told you one or two million people take the bus each month. They want to make sure they capitalize on that. And they're making also six figures in revenue in 12 months. Uh, Mobcard is uh, kind of very, it looks like a Silicon Valley company to me. It's a um, advertising uh, discount platform on your mobile phone. Uh, Time for Innovation, again, you, you, you know, it's Chino's company, the one from the island, right? So they're a queuing system. And when we publish this in TechCrunch, and Dennis also knows this, right? Someone in TechCrunch in the comment box said, this is the stupidest idea, right? Why would people wait in lines or, you know, and then, we realized that there is a lot of places where people still wait in lines for 30 minutes, an hour. I just went to the DMV last year. I waited in line. I had to wait. I had to wait till like my number is A123, whatever, right? You guys remember that. It, if people say, so it's so simple. Literally, you put in your number, right? You get your number. You put in your, SM, your, your um, cell phone. Five minutes before your turn, it says, please come back. It's now your turn. You think it's so simple, right? Why? Because people wait in line an hour, and they just literally wait there. Why can't you grab a cup of coffee first? I tell you when it's your turn, right? So they got um, a big deployment in the Philippines with Smart, which is a telecom company. And now they just launched in Hong Kong. And then they'll be launching in Malaysia and South Africa. They got a big contract with a large financial service remittance company, right? You probably know who that is. It's the biggest one in the world, right? Um, disaster awareness application, dengue mapping, real estate listing, Coursera on mobile, right? A mobile first. Why? Because more people have, as you know, in emerging markets, cell phones than computers. So how do you learn? So even how they designed their education is very mobile centric, right? So that's GN's company, the 19 year old, now 20 year old kid, right? Knee joints, right? How do you make knees, right? Prosthetics, right? Knee, knee replacements, right? But half the cost, if not a quarter of the cost than a Western brand, right? Because most of the knees being produced right now are from Western companies. So guess what? Their sizes are Western sizes, right? Um, so this guy also was an orthopedic surgeon. And his frustration in life is he had to reject patients because he could not, these patients could not afford a knee operation, right? So he said, how do we make a solution? Um, and they have, I think, six operations already completed to date. Weijin is a wind turbine design. Kinetic strips, um, you know, humps that produce energy. So, what is our investment thesis, right? What is the emerging market needs? And then we realize that there's these themes. How do we bucket it, right? So, this is like what we see here, right? Media advertising, retail consumer. But then here's some areas that I personally totally didn't know about. How do we fund entrepreneurs? How do we do that in transportation, in healthcare, 
in energy, especially distributed energy, and literally in education for the masses. Right? How do we do that in an emerging market setting? And then I know this looks like an eye chart, but it's a big anyway, right? So I'll just highlight some of the interesting ones that are in the top 20. Uh, we'll select them in June 5, who's going to be the 10 that we fully support. One thing I am uh, interested in, for example, during Haiyan, um, people did not have light at night, right? They were living literally in darkness, and their houses were already shattered. So this guy said, how do we create a light box that the source of power is salt water? Right? Because salt water is abundant in an archipelago. Right? So how do you create an innovation so that people have light even at night near these coastal areas? Right? How do we think about uh, fish pond monitoring? Right? Because apparently fish die because of what? A couple of things. Too hot, too little oxygen in the water. Right? Right? How do we figure out a platform in the Philippines and maybe in the other Southeast Asian markets to look for these uncovered destinations? Right? Because when you think about Indonesia, everybody thinks about Bali. Right? But besides Bali, where else will you go? I don't know, right? That's a lot of people who say, I don't know. So these guys said, why can't we create these, you know, other destination site? Right? Right. So these are just some of the top 20 that we're supporting, again, in these interesting areas. But what, what is quite intriguing is that half of the top 20 are in the hardware space. Right? So who here, like EEs or Mekis, whatever? Right? Hardware is also becoming kind of an interesting uh, play. So literally half of them are in hardware and half of them are in software. Right. Yes, question. Did you say that's because of the 30% internet penetration that you mentioned? All those startups in the internet that probably don't have just such a big market? Yeah, I mean, and I think what, what our, our thoughts are is that with hardware, um, you know, a lot of the solutions cannot be uh, done just by software, right? So for example, rice drying, you know, these are like physical systems, right? So it's not necessarily just because, but it doesn't mean that it's really no software, right? I mean, it probably has some software like an embedded system, etc. You know, but I think it's really because the problems need physical intervention, not necessarily just because the internet penetration is 30%, right? Um, but that's actually a good question. And Finding those people because the internet wasn't working for you. Yes. Oh, can you talk a bit about what you actually did to like go out and find them? Yeah. So, um, who is familiar with Startup Weekend, right, or whatever hackathons and all these things, right? So, we we schedule it in in the, the big university clusters. And I didn't know that there's thousands of universities in the Philippines that I haven't heard of, right? So we found out that there's these big clusters in all these kind of not necessarily major cities, but pseudo major cities, tier three, tier two cities. And we have to do there and then we go, okay, for today, we, we do a pre-work. Why don't you think about like what type of innovations your locality has, right? And then after like one or two months, we physically go there. We run like a whole one day, two day, like kind of like a seminar on entrepreneurship. We coach them. And then after a while, they submit their ideas, you know, I don't know two or three weeks or even a month after, right? Because they just don't know what, you know, how to do this, right? So the first step is awareness, right? The first step is awareness. That's why our first pillar is inspiration. How do we just inspire people? But then we have to physically go there because you cannot convince, like I cannot convince you, you know, if I just post a YouTube link. Maybe, you, maybe I could, right? Maybe I could, but then, I'm more convincing if I'm right in front of you and say, why don't you do entrepreneurship? I think you're a guy, you know, your idea was so brilliant. I think there's global potential, right? You're more convinced. But if I put, say exact same words on video, would you be convinced? No, and then especially in Asia, we're a very face-to-face -face culture, right? You know, it was taxing, honestly, physically for our team, 
for me, for my team, right? Our team right now is only around five people, right? But then we, again, we run an event every other week, right? Our cadence is somewhere close to Manila, land, and then air, land, air, every month, right? And then the question is when we're tired, why are we doing this? Because guess what? What if you go to these islands and you find the next Chino, right? We don't know. We just have to believe that we could. So that's our deal flow, right? If you want to talk about deal flow, that's how we get our deal flow. It's literally we work with these local agencies and then we physically go there, right? We kind of, you know, there's no, you know, Steve Blank in the Philippines, no Eric Reese, right? There's no all these startup gurus, right? The professors have no clue, right? So how do you actually enable both the academic side, which are the professors, make them believe that their students have these types of ideas? And then how do you actually go there and tell them the, the, the techniques, right, of how to maybe build a interesting idea proposal, a mini business plan that is science or tech oriented? How, right? how, how is that very popular? Yeah, but then a lot of it is uh, game shows and dance competitions, right? I mean, it's like a reality show, same as the U.S., right? So, if you look at TV, would that be much easier instead of flying from island to island? Yeah, that's what I thought, right? Um, you know, but the, the, the issue that we also found out is the economics of media, right? How do we create, for example, advertisers to advertise on that television show? when literally the country, they don't know who watches this. And I said, out of 100 people I talked to, maybe five are intrigued. So just imagine if the ratings are, you know, that type of percentage, who advertiser will go to that? So I, I, I like the thought, right? And I tried, I mean, pushing a startup show, right? Some, you know, and on HBO, like Silicon Valley, whatever, right? So I've been pushing that, but then they always do a feedback loop and say, who's gonna watch, right? And apparently nobody wants to watch a startup show, right? Uh, they want to watch people dancing on TV, you know? Uh, it seems, sounds to me like your audience will be, say, more say, educated and has their entrepreneurial spirit. Correct. But if correct. you're on TV with all the population, maybe more entrepreneurship is be more on the living level and right. the health of the social. So what, what, you, yeah, what we found out is that there's two interesting media that, that like these stories, right? Number one is radio, right? Radio, like you know, AM and FM and stuff, AM actually. And it actually goes more to the provinces. So we do a lot of radio shows. We partner with a lot of radio shows. Um, and then another one that we partner with is the, the, the newsprint, right? And again, the internet penetration is 30%, so most people still get their news from physical paper, right? And they write these stories. So actually, that's where we get a lot of people getting also inquiries from us. It's these two different media. The TV side, um, you know, the mass market channels that go literally to, you know, the farmlands and stuff, their economics, you know, they, the economics just doesn't work for them, right? Um, but then at least from the media, newsprint and radio, they can diversify a little bit on what, you know, this, like, this looks like news to them, right? This looks like something that, you know, a uh, special feature, right? So we go on TV, but literally we're always embedded in a news program. So intriguing, huh? I mean, uh, you know, I always thought it's like a different, okay, go ahead. That's a bit of another question. I know that there is a huge remittance channel uh, Correct. Um, corridor to the Philippines. And they have quite like advanced mobile payment, GCash, yes, mobile money. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Is that why you didn't include kind of like finance in one of these categories because it's so saturated already? Yeah, actually, it's a huge opportunity, honestly. And uh, and uh, for example, Chino's company, their main client now is a remittance center, right? Because I guess a lot of Filipinos, etc., they line up for two hours in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Malaysia to send money back home. And I thought, why would people, right, send money physically, right? That's always the big question, right? And then, for example, smart is a big, you know, big remittance or whatever. But then Chino's insight was intriguing because they went to, you know, to Hong Kong and all these things. 
People want, again, what culturally, the face-to-face -face interaction. I give you $10. I know you'd give my family $8 back, right? Or $9 back, right? Because I, I know I can go after you as a person if things don't work out, right? Uh, I mean, I, I look at you, I go to the shop, etc. And then another thing is that remittance, um, especially like, for example, like Western Union, it's just ubiquitous, right? You go to the next major town, there's a remittance, and you can do it instantly, right? For mobile money, how do you get cash out? Right? You have to go to, again, a major bank. You have to go to a major bank, right? So if I have to go to a major bank, that's another major city. Right. I have to travel maybe an hour, two hours to go to the major city to get the money out. So Western Union is pretty smart, and even the other major remittances, it's all about distribution. Right? It's all about going to like these tier three provinces and have an agent there to give the money almost instantly. Right? It's instant gratification. Right? People like the instant gratification thing here. Literally, it's cash gratification Right? instantly. Right? Even if I have to pay. But then I know, you know why? Because these people are blue collar workers. They literally get their wages on a weekly basis, right? And then their families depend on it on a weekly basis. So how do you make sure that people get the money when they need it quickly, right? Because they have a tuition to pay, they have electric bills, they have, you know, all food, right? So these are the things that we have to, but I want to invest in more, you know, uh, Overseas Filipino worker corridor solution. So like Chino is kind of interesting and that's play, but I want more of that to uh, take advantage of. Oh. Yep. Is there a start working on the international uh, remittance, yeah. Yeah, money yeah. flow, yeah. Correct. especially to the Philippines? Correct. Because it's such a big corridor. Correct. But the local con uh, conversion fulfillment to get cash into people's hands from the mobile. Real cash. Yeah, that's something that Smart controls, Smart yeah. and MasterCard. So why not work with Smart to open the API and then incubate a company specific to that? I mean, that's something that's clearly a huge problem. Yeah. It's something that your organization can handle. Correct. So the, the, the one thing is that we, we partnered with the, the largest bank, actually, BDO. And that's the money that they can take out, right? Um, and that's, that's really the, the question that we have is how to get, and we couldn't still find that right solution. How do we get people actual cash? Right? People that can feel the cash. And we still haven't done that. And then we thought, yes? Uh, actually, I'd like to kind of turn that question a little bit into a process question. Are you expecting the entrepreneurs to bring you the idea already? Or are you actually going out and proposing ideas to no, potential so, entrepreneurs? Um, it's like every VC. We always say, here's some interesting areas we're trying to look for uh -huh. every time we run a cohort. Yeah. right? But then it's literally open to any type of idea uh, focused on looking for a problem, right? It's like, what is our major filter, right? What is yeah. the need? So I guess what is the market? Right? Is what is the solution? Maybe that wouldn't have been your position to have proposed a partnership. Yeah, so unless uh, somebody that's, that's has right, an idea that's right, already uh, in the incubator. Yeah, Dennis, is if someone comes to us with a remittance based idea that will solve that solution, I most likely will invest in them. Right, but then the issue is that maybe ha no one has come to us specifically for that yet. Um, so maybe someone in this room can think about an interesting idea, right? So, uh, well, anyway, uh, yes. There was the issue on internet bandwidth, the speed and reliability, yeah, 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 yeah. and I see majority or more than half of your startups uh, involve internet. Correct, correct. Do you find any issue around user experience, finding issues that, you know, some users would find it very slow and all that? How yeah, so, that? yeah, well, actually, the video compression, all these things in Skype. The, the interesting part is that they consider that. So when they do either the architecture or when they do the code, they know that that's a reality. Right, so they already optimize for low bandwidth situations, right? So not a lot are video. Maybe the education has some sort of video component, but then most of them are not necessarily video heavy or like large bandwidth hoggers, right? So how do we encourage our entrepreneurs to live in that world? And then it's all about access to, to the internet. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily that there's internet because a lot of things you can do with like, you know, one, two, three MBPS, five MPS. You can do a lot of things already with that. 
especially transactional, etc. But then it's about how to get more people to use your service. So what's happening now in a lot of the telecoms in emerging markets is called whitelisting. Have you guys heard about whitelisting? Right? What it is is that I will do a deal with the telecom operator. I will pay, for example, 10 cents to access your app for one day. One day, right? So I can make my bus booking, I can make my, you know, whatever. But then what does it do? It gives more access to your app to more people because they can afford their internet. Right, because people don't have to pay per month. They pay literally per app now. Before it was per day, now it's even more sachet, it's called, into a per app basis. So that's how I think people will address the access part. And then obviously with white listing, there's some quality of service that they try to guarantee, right? That sounds like internet Yeah, so uh, I don't know if it's a, uh, you know, uh, and you, I won't comment on that just because I'm in the telecom and, you know. Um, yeah, but I have a question. How comes that all the people kind of shop on Instagram? How does that work? And how do that make? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. So, if you look at the statistics, for people who don't know, one of the major Facebook, Twitter, Instagram users in the world, right, from an internet penetration perspective. And what I found out, again, I was pretty shocked. If you look at the movement, of people, when they upload pictures or when they do these things, it's stationary. Why is it stationary? Like in Stanford. Any thoughts? They turn on the Wi-Fi. People have smartphones, but they don't have mobile data. Right? So the first thing people ask, I go to Starbucks, I go to University X, where's your Wi-Fi? Is there free Wi-Fi? And then they start taking photos, uploading stuff, all these things, right? So it's all stationary. Right, so again, that's how people, you know, do their bookings, do their stuff. Sometimes all in a stationary position. It's because you know people are frugal. You know, I mean, GDP per capita again is what three thousand plus. You know, so how do they optimize every single dollar, right? And by doing looking for free things, you know. Um, and this is not a phenomenon only in the Philippines. Uh, you know, as you know, I used to work in Cisco. Same phenomenon, for example, in India, same phenomenon in other emerging markets is this kind of stationary uh, smartphone usage, right? Um, and then they turn it on again. And then if they really need to, they, they pay that per day, right? I do uh, one internet, whatever, per day on the phone if they need it. But then if they don't need it, they're stationary. I think we're getting into a discussion of internet use, and we yeah. want to stay on entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, but I, this is actually good, um, good thoughts. And the 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 answer is, I think ninety, at least maybe ninety or ninety five percent are prepaid in the market, right? Um, so I just put this slide up uh, just because one thing that is happening, you know, that there's a growth of the economy. I saw the hockey stick. Um, our ecosystem only in the past two years literally has gone end to end, which is good, right? Before we started, no one invested in idea at stage. Just imagine if you're a Stanford student, you have an idea, or you're a Stanford equivalent in the Philippines, no one will give you capital. Banks give collateralized loans for $10,000 and above, right? So if you had a good idea, you need $10,000 from the bank, give me your watch, give me your car, give me everything, right? That's the reality. So if you are an entrepreneur without assets, just intellectual assets, you're screwed. So we had to fill on that stage, right? There's others that came in, even regional, like 500, IMJ, they're now going to the Philippines, getting more things. And then in the expansion stage, it also uh, increased. Right, so now I think we're kind of set up that there's a chance if you have an interesting idea from the R&D stage to go from one stage to another. But this only happened, started after late 2011. So it's like two and a half years old. Was there an event in 2011 that caused that? So um, I won't take credit, right? Um, I moved back in late 2011, no, I was kidding. Um, which is true, which is true. 
Um, but how it was, and this is the same actually when I saw also in other Southeast Asian countries, when the major telecom operators now say, I have a venture fund, things go crazy, right? So there's only two mobile operators in the Philippines. It's us, Smart, and another one called Globe, it's Gcash. We literally announce our incubator funds, incubator early stage funds, a day apart. Right, so I said, I'm gonna launch this incubator fund the day after they said, we also have an incubator fund or early stage fund, right? And then after that, people started getting interest, especially the regional investors saying, oh, there's something going on. So that's a good question, Richard, is you need triggers, right? It's all about triggers in your ecosystem. And we're lucky that the two largest companies um, said, which are the telecom operators, said, we will actually invest in these early stage ideas. Um, you know, and then the rest. But before, there was only this. Late stage, and then people just discussing ideas. Nothing was in the middle, right? I mean, there's the seamers and plug and plays, but then they do spot investments when they like. I mean, nobody so. come to you said, I'm going to start on a bicycle, have a little Wi-Fi station. I go any place and collect the money, you use Wi-Fi for 20 minutes. Yeah, so how will you get the capital if you don't have a rich uncle? I mean, uh, buy a bicycle and just on uh, Wi-Fi sign up, uh, that's uh, only hundreds of some dollars. <laughs> yeah. Right, so that's, so th these are, it could be, and then you can kind of self-finance. So maybe that's, that's what happens, right? Um, but in a scenario where you need, you know, even a thousand dollars, right? So uh, actually, hundred. How much is the Apple? Hundred bucks now, right? To get the license, right? To develop iOS apps, and then you need a Mac, and then you need a Mac, right? So that's a thousand something dollars, right? Maybe a Mac Mini or whatever, right? right? Maybe now, yeah, eight ninety nine. Sorry. So just imagine, just to create an iOS app, you need at least a thousand dollars. Guess how much the tuition of GN was? Hundred dollars. That's ten x tuition. This is the reality, right? I mean, how do we support these guys? And that's the, that's the question. That's a very interesting question, right? I mean, how do we make sure people have that opportunity if they have? They have an interesting idea, right? Because maybe even, so again, that number one graduate of engineering made $500 a month, right? Minus taxes, maybe 350. That's one third of his monthly salary, your bicycle and Wi-Fi, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So and then minus the transportation and yeah. everything, right? right so now there's many, uh, you know, revamped uh, the laptop and all hundred. So, bucks. so that's really the the question. And how do we, you know, uh, just enable and unleash intellectual capital, right? Um, right. So I'm kind of coming kind of going through uh, kind of the NRA presentation. And people always ask, what was the lessons in the journey, right, of, you know, when I thought about this concept in 2011, till we launched it in March 2012, and now we have, you know, close to two batches, 18 investments, et cetera, right? And these things are all common sense because we're in Silicon Valley, right? But this is real, you know? If you just give access to capital, it will actually smoke out the people who want your money. Right? People who have interesting ideas, they will come to you uh, and at least this opportunity. You have to take out biases in emerging markets just because there's so much bias based on cultural, societal, um, you know, history for the past hundreds of years. Right? So how do you do that? We're early, but then it's growing quickly. Um, my theory and I hope that I'll be improved right when five years from now when some of my companies IPO, is how to perfect it in the emerging markets, right? Go regional, and then go to developed countries like Europe and the US. Because my theory is that there's some problems that is ignored in, in places like the US, right? Queuing, et cetera. But nobody wants to do these unsexy ideas. But somebody has to solve them. I think that will come from places like the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, et cetera, right? And then most of my entrepreneurs are focused on getting revenue early because it's unsure, right? Will I get the next financing round? 
as much as we're end to end, that's the entire list, right? Silicon Valley, there's hundreds of VCs, right? That's the entire list of VCs in one slide. How do you guarantee that you survive if you don't make the next round? Revenue, right? So that's why uh, three of my companies now are making six-figure revenue in 12 months, right? Sorry, I have a typo here. And then my plea every time I'm in Silicon Valley is how do I get them to understand that there is opportunity in places like you know, the Philippines, places like Indonesia, places like Myanmar, and then maybe mentor them to become global companies, right? And that's really the plea I have every time I come here because I know that there's too much risk, right? People say, why did you incorporate a nonprofit? There's stage risk, early stage. There's entrepreneur risk. These guys are typically not Stanford grads, right? And then there's also the market risk. They're from the Philippines, right? And how do you make sure I educate them and then make them a little bit more comfortable, right? That there is opportunity in backing some of these bright entrepreneurs. They just wasn't born, you know, in places like Silicon Valley, right? Okay, so that's really what I have. I know we, we already did Q&A, but then if people have more questions. Uh, actually, we do have 10 minutes for questions. And I do want to take them. Okay, well, yeah. first of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. I noticed in the DevX video, a book, Game Changer, co-authored by Ram Shah. Okay. What books do you, would you recommend to Filipino entrepreneurs, having been a GSB student? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I, I can't think of any right now except maybe like Good to Great or something like that. Yeah. And, and it's because how do you build a global standard company at day one, even if everyone around you is not building a global standard company, right? And that's why I want to make sure that they do the things and build the systems and get the ambition to go global rather than to just make you know, a small business. So Earl, good to great. Good to the great. classic problem in the incubator business is that companies get comfortable in the incubator. <laughs> and so it's hard to get them out. What do you do to kind of push the companies out? to make them graduate. Yeah, so the, the question for people who didn't, uh, li uh, didn't hear it is, how do I kick out the companies, right? Um, Especially to make them be successfully graduating, <laughs> right? No, I think this is one of the big changes in the whole incubation business, the difference between incubation and acceleration. Yes. I and mean, we've really gone into version 2.0. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. The, and the answer really there is, the, the honest answer is that they never leave, right? Um, the honest answer is they never leave, but it doesn't mean that they're not physically there. They will always ask for your support. They always see them in board meetings. You invite them to events, you know, but they also form their own alumni network, kind of, right? So they all get together. They all want to be like with themselves because as most of you guys know, entrepreneurship is a lonely business. Even here, it's a lonelier business in places like the Philippines, right? So they always want a cohort with them, even if they're already at the more mature stage, right? Mm -hmm. So every time we have like a, a public event, et cetera, they all show up, right? Because they want the feeling of, I'm with other people to help me with the journey. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see it as a problem that they don't leave. I mean, they leave physically, they leave um, from a time resource perspective, but I like it that I see them uh, often and then they always update me as to what their progress is. But you haven't really had to push them in terms of growing faster, getting to market faster, uh, or do I, I do that during board meetings, so. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. Yes, in the back. Yeah, my question has to do with, you know, how do you balance um, in your selection criteria what IDs want to fund, the, uh, the, the maximizing or optimizing revenue, uh, reconciling that with emerging market, market size and a global marketplace. Yeah, so um, in general, we are still disciplined as to what the, you know, what the TAM is, right? The target, the tar addressable market, right? So if it's a big local market, for example, the bus or the travel market in general in the Philippines, you know, it's pretty big. So when we funded the bus reservation system, um, I don't know how will they scale the same way, for example, to go to Vietnam. But 
in the Philippines alone, right, there's millions of people who take the bus each month. So I know that that addressable market is quite large in general. For example, the queuing system, I know that there's only the large financial institutions, maybe hospitals, maybe telecom that will fund it in the Philippines. So I know that the TAM locally is much smaller. The TAM regionally will get bigger, and then globally there's more, right? So I think per startup, we have to think about what is their pie, right? And then is the pie big enough? So there's always a threshold, but it's always a dollar value, not a geographic value, right? So how do you make sure you get enough um, interesting TAM for the Philippines, and then after that, an interesting TAM for the people who need to go regional to make it a justified investment, right? Because if these guys that are small TAM in the Philippines don't, you know, don't go regional, I won't get the multiplier to grow my endowment fund. So right. follow-up on that is, so <coughs> what's had transpired over the past 10 years in terms of the rise of China mm -hmm. and Correct. the growing export of China, what is anecdotally the number two market that the uh, entrepreneurs look at after Philippines? Is it the US or is it China or <coughs> some other smaller country? Yeah, and I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, at least the entrepreneurs that I, I, I discuss, interestingly enough, it's if they, so the Philippines and their problems, so we have, you know, 100 million people. I think the top 5% look like Singapore, right? So the problems look like Singapore, et cetera. The 95 look like the rest of Southeast Asia. So if they're in the kind of bottom 95% problem, they go to Indonesia, right? So their, their aspiration, how do I scale into Indonesia? For the top one, for example, the queuing system because they're focused on B2B, they go to Hong Kong or Singapore, right? And then from that, hopefully, they do a developed market pilot that they can go to other developed markets. So um, that's, the I think, the intriguing part of working in the Philippines where you get these two types of ideas, you know, the, this side and that side, right? So that side, their market, how do you go to Indonesia? This side, how do you go to Singapore, Hong Kong, and maybe even in the US? But China, interesting enough, not a lot of my, besides Hong Kong, right? But not a lot of entrepreneurs say, I'm gonna go to China next. I think it's also just a lack of understanding of, you know, how to market in China from outside. Actually, even U.S. companies have uh, trouble also entering China, you know, um, from from our end, you know. So, Earl, with the nonprofit model, right? <laughs> uh, you have a lot of choices of what's going to get funding and what's not going to get funding. Yes. If you were doing a for-profit model, it would be relatively easy. You look at the market opportunity and so on and so forth. Yeah. What kind of uh, how do you do the process of looking at the social impact and deciding what you're going to bring into the incubator? Yeah, so, um, you know, I always have a threshold that these social impact companies should have a revenue model that hopefully will scale, right? But then, you know, my returns may not be, you know, maybe like a 2x return instead of a 5x, 10x, you know, 100x return, right, in some of the companies. So I think that's how... I'm lucky because um, you know, my trustee structured as a nonprofit fund, so I can take more risk, right? So how do I support these entrepreneurs who have high impact, low return, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then balance it out with a portfolio with potential high return, but then a little bit less of an impact. So I have to balance the two together because all of them in the end comes to one portfolio and then one return of the fund. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's the intriguing part of what I'm doing. But people always say, "Why can't I just, you know, give you an idea, but it won't make money? So fund me." I don't do that, right? <laughs> I have to fund things that will sustain themselves and not even sustain, scale themselves, even if it's social or emerging market oriented. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? Um, but that's very different with some of the things that I've seen. So if this is successful. In five years, will your endowment be a lot bigger, and so you'll be doing more, or what will happen? Yeah, I hope so, right? <laughs> or else uh, the whole foundation is gone, right? Um, but the, the, the next game, right, um, you know, for me, it's either or, right? So I want to expand to other countries in Southeast Asia, right? 
um, you know, maybe like have either have a, a business development ecosystem building office like in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make an office, we announced this already, uh, an office in San Francisco, right? So either incubate companies in San Francisco to go to Asia or fund companies that have an emerging market focus, maybe create a venture fund, right? Because I need to build a corridor, right? Yeah. If you're entrepreneurs in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Myanmar, guess what? Going to Silicon Valley and stepping foot here is a feat. I want to make sure that it's not a feat, it's an achievable goal, right? So that's why I said I will open up an office in Silicon Valley so that every ASEAN startup in emerging markets of ASEAN has a chance to go here easier than have to go to like these you know, big incubator funds, right? So that's one, that's one. And then five, ten years from now, you know, hopefully we, you know, the ecosystems in these parts of the world are big. We create a emerging Asia venture fund that is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? That's the end game. Yeah, I right. think the knowledge flow from one market to another is a really interesting part of that. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of the bottom of the pyramid plays really could translate from one emerging market to another. Correct. And a lot of it is just lack of information. Flow. Lack of information. And then just imagine... You know, some of you guys, even your Stanford undergrads or grad school or professionals, they need your knowledge, right? These guys, why can't they do a telepresence this side in Stanford, a telepresence this side in Manila, Jakarta, right? And then you talk about your experience. That is the vision, right? It's a virtual corridor between this side and that side. So the information flow is just much easier. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dennis there used to be my MBA intern last summer. Uh, so for people who want to intern in the Philippines, uh, do let me know after my, my talk, right? And I think Dennis can talk about that from a first-hand experience of how is it to intern in an emerging market. Uh, just a show of hands, who here has been to the Philippines or Southeast Asia, right? So a couple of you, right? So that's actually good. Um, what I want to talk to you about is really the intersection of, you know, my experience here, for example, in Silicon Valley, and then what the experience that I saw when I moved back to the Philippines about two, two and a half years ago, right? And this is what Idea Space is. Um, I know you had a, a speaker from, uh, I think, is it Japan? And, uh, then, and, uh, then China. and then China. And in the Philippines, it's going to be a very different type of innovation. Uh, innovation that's focused on emerging market needs. And I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. So, you know, um, please let me know if you have any questions at any time in the 45 minutes to an hour. I want to make this an interactive discussion, and hopefully these stories will inspire you to really help out the people in emerging markets. Right, so for people who don't know anything about the Philippines, um, we're actually a island nation, right? Um, well, a, a, a nation with a, a 7,107 islands. Uh, just below Hong Kong, uh, a laser. Okay, uh, I haven't done a laser in a long time, but uh, cool, right? Uh, right. So this is where it is. This is where uh, Indonesia is. This is Brunei. So we are at the east side of Southeast Asia, but very also close to Taiwan, Hong Kong, right? In the next couple of years. Um, I'll actually shift now to a video so you can think about what are the different problems and then what are the different solutions that's happening now in the Philippines. So this was, I'm not going to take credit for the video, it's uh, from uh, the DevEx. It's like a LinkedIn for the you know, international development community. Uh, and then I got this thing called the 40 under 40. So it's a good overview on the Philippines and the opportunities in the Philippines. I realized that uh, education is such a huge problem in this country. 
there's so much hunger in the Philippines. The biggest roadblock really is the fast-growing population of our country. We are a, a country in transition, and as we transition, there are actually a lot of problems that need, need to be solved. I think all businesses and all development work comes first from finding a problem, and most importantly, a problem that you have the skills to address. We see uh, big organizations working on big issues. But we also see a lot of everyday heroes, they say, making a difference in the communities where they work. The Philippines has always been this potential that has not seen its potential. At a certain point, I realized that I wanted to do something. Kong, etc. But what's unique about the Philippines is not necessarily just our geography, but also our cultural heritage, right? So we were a Spanish colony, uh, the main Spanish colony in Asia for 300 plus years. And we're also an American colony for around 50 years. Right, just think about it, right? European, American, in Asia. That's the Philippines. So for example, my name is Earl, right? That's a Western name. My last name is Valencia, which is a Hispanic name, Latin name. But then I'm from Asia. Right, and that's what the Philippines is. That's why I think it's a very interesting platform for people to pilot products or to have products to pilot in the Philippines and then expand to other countries. In fact, a lot of the startups and also some of the large companies use the Philippines as a test market. I know when I was here in the GSB, Taco Bell did their, their uh, pilot in Southeast Asia in the Philippines just because American affiliation. Right? So I moved back to Asia uh, after about 12 years uh, being in the US. Right, and Richard talked about kind of my experiences. And I'll tell you about the main surprises that I've seen uh, when I went back to the Philippines. And uh, you guys will also be surprised because we have this concept of what innovation is in Silicon Valley, right? I was in you know, the headquarters of Cisco looking at like how to create the next billion dollar business in networking. And what's our mantra? In a world of unlimited bandwidth, guess what? Most of the world don't have unlimited bandwidth. In fact, most of the world don't even have the internet. How do you work in a world that the internet is sparse and the internet is not ubiquitous, right? And what are the problems faced with the millions of people in these types of situations, right? So um, the Philippines, again, is quite interesting because we're the second largest uh, country by population in Southeast Asia, about 100 million people. Uh, 12 largest in the world. Interesting fact is that 10% of our population lives outside the Philippines, around 10 million people, right? Um, we're one of the youngest countries. People, 50% are under 23. So that's quite also intriguing. So we don't have the baby boomer problems uh, like in uh, the West. And then our main common language is actually English, right? So people talk in Filipino, but then most people will understand English. And that's why um, the big growth area also in the Philippines is the outsourcing market, right? So we're the fastest, second fastest growing nation in Asia after China, around 7% growth, right? Um, you know, but one thing that we don't have yet is that our GDP per capita is still around the 3,000, maybe now $3,500 range, right? So just imagine, if you're an investor, right, and you give somebody $10,000, $15,000, that's already five times, right, the average per capita of the country. So the, the beauty about that is that you can do a lot. You can make products with very little capital, right? And that's the opportunity for some of you guys who might want to invest in emerging markets to create product there and perhaps think about how to globalize uh, from that situation, right? And then you can see here that there's really this hockey stick that's happening only the past five to seven years, right? Happening in our country. So that's, that's really the, the, the interesting part of actually a lot of the emerging markets in Asia, maybe in Africa, is that you have this hockey stick literally only in the past five plus years. So what does that mean? There is both hunger and there is optimism. 
Right? There is optimism as to what's going to happen in the country and where can their lives be, especially we have a lot of young people. With more social impact, what drives me is being able to provide opportunities to every Filipino. I want to improve healthcare in this country. I want to improve the lives of people. Harness our natural resources and to change the world one company at a time. Using my talents to really lift up our country through what I know best. Economic and personal empowerment is something very powerful. For me, that kind of transformation is also what drives me. If there's anything that's going to come out, especially in development in the Philippines, I think a key thing is governance, good governance. All along, I've had this interest and passion for applying private sector discipline to development and to do something that has social impact. My passion is really to, to see meaning in what I do and to see actual impact in the lives of the people that we really want to help. Definitely headed in, in the right direction. That's um, very loud and clear. I believe that the Filipino is one of the greatest minds in the whole world. But people just have to know that we exist. Nonprofit sector here in the country, civil society is very strong. Primarily because it's natural for Filipinos to help each other. I'm most motivated when I see for myself how our programs have actually helped uplift the quality of life of the people. And that drives me every day when I get up and realize that what we're doing is benefiting the lives of millions of Filipinos. Knowing that at least we're making some small difference.